Great. So we're, uh, we're a couple minutes ahead of schedule. I'll just take the uh, opportunity to mention uh, the Science to Solutions is a, a really nice uh, stepping off point. Both the initiatives that have been, uh, I guess, initiated by NRCS and, and both been encompassed by lar larger partnerships have been trying to make that, that tr uh, transfer of technology to the field and to landowners through these series known as Science to Solutions. And so you can find, whether it's mesquite, cedar, juniper, a variety of other conservation issues facing prairie chickens and sage grouse, you can find those uh, on the respective websites. Uh, additionally, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with NRCS, we often think of them as this, you know, this sort of machine of, of implementing conservation, working with private landowners. And, and while that's certainly true, uh, there is a component of NRCS that is, in fact, the, uh, the assessment of those programs. And so a large portion of the work that you've heard about today, both on the sage grouse and lesser prairie chicken side, has been supported by what we know, what we refer to as the conservation effects and assessment program arm of NRCS and, and really has been instrumental in getting uh, science on the ground uh, for both of these species as well as the grazing lands component of of our working lands that that really we we haven't even touched upon here yet today. So, um, with that, we're are we on time now? Okay, great. We're going to uh, go ahead and bring on our next speaker. Again, a slight change um, in schedule. Um, Matt Bogey from the U.S. Geological Survey, where he is a Ph.D. candidate at New Mexico State University, will be giving us a presentation on prairie chickens. So moving a little bit south and central uh, North America. Okay, thanks Christian and uh, thanks everyone for hanging in there. I know it's getting late. So uh, as Christian alluded to, we're, we're moving to a different, different encroacher of, of uh, woody species and also a different grouse species. Um, so we know that uh, encroachment of woody vegetation in the Great Plains has been a big issue, and it's been historically these large, contiguous, unbroken prairies. Um, and there's been a large change in composition and structure through various kind of factors, uh, suppression of natural fire regimes, drought, anthropogenic influences. And this has kind of promoted the establishment and encroachment of uh, woody vegetation into these regions. So who are the encroachers specifically? Put it up. Okay. So who are the encroachers specifically? Uh, Eastern red cedar in the northern portions of the Great Plains and honey mesquite in the southern portions, which is where I'm going to be focusing uh, the talk today. And in the southern portion um, of the short grass uh, prairie, more specifically, scaling down to the uh, Shinnery Oak uh, Prairie. So mechanis mechanisms of encroachment, uh, dispersal of seeds by livestock, lack of fire, and uh, changing in climate patterns. So this has prompted concerns for uh, grassland communities that have been uh, threatened by this mesquite encroachment, specifically grassland obligate birds. And this really kind of distills down to the effects of mesquite to outcompete herbaceous and uh, perennial grasses, which reduces cover and forage for wildlife and ultimately constricts available habitat. So the lesser prairie chicken requires these large contiguous blocks of grassland um, and mesquite encroachment has been identified as an important uh, area for research and an objective to investigate how this encroachment of mesquite in these prairies is influencing prairie chickens. And so we set out to quantify some of these effects. So specifically, our objectives were to uh, evaluate how the distribution of mesquite and also the seasonal defoliation of mesquite, so the canopy cover of mesquite, influences the habitat decisions of prairie chickens seasonally, so both in the breeding and non-breeding season. And this gets at, more specifically, determining how these behavioral patterns associated with mesquite presence influences their behavior in the breeding and non-breeding season. And we use something called resource utilization functions to try to answer some of these questions, 
which uh, basically evaluates resource conditions within these areas where these prairie chickens are focusing or concentrating their use, and then tries to relate those to various landscape metrics, which we think would be important to describe that use. So our study area was in uh, New Mexico, the Sands Ranch and Mescalero Sands area of environmental concern, critical environmental concern, and then associated state and uh, federal land holdings. Just in general, this area has a history of disturbance um, and can be characterized as a mosaic of, of shinery oak with uh, prairie dominated sand hills and sandy plains. Pretty traditional capture and tracking efforts um, occurred during the breeding season on these communal uh, breeding grounds. And uh, we fitted males and females with VHF or satellite transmitters and then relocated these birds two to three times per week, except for the females. It was on a daily occurrence during the breeding season. So resource utilization functions have two components. The first is the utilization distribution, which is uh, pictured here. Um, and you can see on the X and Y axis at the base of the graph, they're just geographic coordinates. Um, and then on the Z axis, we have a metric of intensity of use or probability of occurrence or um, uh, differential space use. And so the higher the peak is on that distribution, the higher probability of, of finding a bird in that particular area. So this is a utilization distribution, just rep representation, just, just for a single individual. And so it's also important in the resource utilization functions to define what's available to the bird. And in this case, we use the 95% volume of the probability density, and that's just fancy wording for saying that we selected an isopleth level that we thought would best represent what's available to an individual bird. And um, yeah, so that's the first component. The second component is you have to incorporate some type of uh, spatial metric. So uh, we devised three different spatial metrics. One of them was the mesquite canopy layer, which uh, Mike Falkowski gave a presentation on yesterday of how that was derived. So if you're interested in that, you can uh, track him down or go look in the most recent uh, grouse issue in the uh, Rangeland and Ecology and Management Journal. So I'm not going to go into details of exactly how that was derived, but basically a classified mesquite canopy into uh, these seven classes ranging from low to high, so going from zero to six. Um, and then a layer representing distance to mesquite or Euclidean distance to mesquite, so actual physical Cartesian distance to an actual mesquite shrub, and uh, Euclidean distance to Lex. So in these models, they're just multiple regression models that control for autocorrelation. The response variable was the actual value within a utilization distribution. Um, and then the covariates were these pixel values of these three different spatial layers that we derived. And the objective was to make these population level inferences that incorporated both um, intra and inter animal variability and ultimately predict intensity of use across our study area. So detecting avoidance, um, this mesquite canopy layer was created during the period that coincides with the growing period of mesquite, which is during the breeding season for the prairie chickens. And so it likely overestimates relative mesquite canopy in the non-breeding season as mesquite plants are partially defoliated during this period. However, it offered us this unique opportunity to kind of look at what exactly are prairie chickens potentially avoiding if they're avoiding anything at all. And so we came up with two different scenarios that kind of captures this essence. Um, the first one is if lesser prairie chickens are avoiding mesquite in both seasons, we expect this negative response between distance to mesquite and the mesquite canopy um, in, both these, in both seasons as it relates to how these birds are using the landscape. And then the second scenario is if chickens are just avoiding areas with high canopy cover of mesquite, not necessarily the physical presence of a mesquite bush, 
we'd expect to see a more negative relationship with distance to mesquite in the breeding season compared to the non-breeding season, but also the potential for prairie chickens to be utilizing areas in the non-breeding season that were avoided in the breeding season because of this high mesquite canopy not being present in the non-breeding season. So jumping right into our results. So we developed uh, resource utilization functions for 24 birds and 26 birds in the breeding and non-breeding season, respectively. And it's important to keep in mind um, this mean size of home range, this seasonal difference. So there's almost a two-fold increase in home range size between the breeding and non-breeding season, which is pretty substantial. So even though there was this expansion in home range sizes seasonally, we ended up finding similar results throughout the season. So this figure is just a representation of our standardized coefficients, which came out of our resource utilization function models. And you can see they're, they're pretty similar across the board for the breeding and non-breeding season. So there's just in general, on average, a higher probability of using areas closer to Lex, um, farther away from mesquite, and then also lower canopy mesquite. So it's a pretty clear indication that, that the data suggests these birds are in fact avoiding mesquite. Diving in a little bit deeper though, we see that on this figure, on the y-axis, we have intensity of use going from low to high. So um, think back to that utilization distribution and, and what the z-axis on that figure means. An actual breakdown, so quartiles of the mesquite canopy class. And what you can glean from this is that less than 1% of mesquite canopy accounted for um, the largest percent within utilization distributions across all individuals. And so the less than 1% was that zero canopy class. And then the uh, one to five percent canopy class, which was the, excuse me, one to five percent canopy, which was the one canopy class, comprised of less than 15% of all utilization distributions, um, regardless of season, suggesting a pretty low tolerance of mesquite canopy. Okay. So looking at just general presence of mesquite, so percent mesquite present within the utilization distributions was low across seasons. And for any value of intensity of use, we see that it was less than 0.05%. So, and even though it was that low, we still saw a pretty major decline from areas of low intensity of use to areas of higher intensity of use. So going um, from one to up to 95 on that y-axis. <clears throat> okay, so the uh, patterns of predict predicted intensity of use were pretty compelling. These birds have a strong affinity to use areas towards lex sites and um, just general avoidance of mesquite. So if we take a look at this figure, this is a representation of predicted intensity of use from those resource utilization functions um, within our study area. And so we see these closed triangles, which are actual LEC sites. And as you radiate away from these LEC sites, if you look at this um, inset here that's kind of a magnification, you see a pretty steep decline in probability of use. And then if you look at those dark digitized dots, those are actual mesquite bushes. And you can see it kind of eating in right here into the um, probability surface, indicating that, that yeah, these birds, when they encounter mesquite, there's, there's a pretty strong aversion and a, and a negative behavioral response. So results emphasize the importance of maintaining these um, areas with low prevalence of mesquite and removing mesquite to increase potential colonization of uh, new areas for, for lecking and, and nesting. So our implications. Um, the common theme throughout today's symposium has been this persistence of, of woody encroachment and, and this emerging issue and its effect on grouse. And it's important to really target this me mechanistic response of, of the species that you're interested in to determine if, if management efforts are, are both logistically and, and financially sound. 
And our data suggests that there's a pretty strong aversion to mesquite for, for lesser prairie chickens, both of regions of, of high canopy cover and just in general mesquite presence. So the long standing kind of mantra for state, federal, and private agencies in Mexico has been solely relying on, on chemical treatment um, as, as the primary means of, of mesquite removal. However, given our data, it seems like chemical treatment's probably not a, st a standalone effective strategy and it needs to be supplemented with removal of standing structures because of this aversion to, to the presence of mesquite, but also these, these lower canopy areas. So I'll leave you with these two final kind of conclusions. Um, we, we believe that our, our results can direct conservation strategies that aim at minimizing these li limiting factors on the landscape for lesser prairie chickens, particularly in the southern portion of their range, which is this encroachment of woody vegetation. And so there's, there's two different kind of recommendations that are being put into practice as we speak um, that are related to our findings. So actively treating these areas with um, lower canopy uh, mesquite cover and removing that mesquite can actually try to maintain habitat and limit habitat loss. But a larger investment is these restorative efforts. So require, this will require targeting areas with high canopy mesquite cover, high prevalence of mesquite, and the occupied range of these birds. And this potential to increase connectivity between habitat and also availability of habitat and increasing these environments that are suitable for these birds throughout their life history. With that, I'd like to uh, thank all the collaborators and funders, particularly all the contributing authors to this uh, research who just saw it through completion, Bureau of Land Management, the Lesser Prairie Chicken Initiative, uh, the Center for Excellence in Hazardous Material uh, Management, and who administer the Mexico Cooper Cooperative Conservation Agreement, and then finally, New Mexico State University. And with that, I could take any questions. Christian? Yeah, can you speak a little bit more <clears throat> to the fact that uh, that's sort of that linked for the fact that the spatial doubling of that context in the context of 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 the context so that increase in size, we did see some, a little bit more variability in um, the estimates of those coefficients and the resource utilization functions. And I think that's probably likely because these birds were incorporating a little bit more areas with mesquite on the peripheries and fringes of, of their utilization distributions or their home ranges. But still, there's, there's a pretty tight relationship seasonally, even though those, those did double in size. Not at all. Yeah, it, it didn't reflect the growth and expansion in those home ranges in the non-breeding season. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 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 I don't know exactly what the height I, cut. Sure. Yeah, and those potentially can still be used as substrate for raptors and stuff, right? And uh, Cause, cause an issue. So I'm not exactly sure what the threshold is for height of, of removal and, and, you know, when that response of, of a predator might, might kind of fade out as far as using that site. But uh, it seems like removal is probably the key word, actual removal. And go ahead, Christian.
And I think previous, to, to go off what Christian just said, I think previous uh, work out of my lab with prairie chicken, prairie chicken habitat selection has demonstrated that like that 60 centimeter height is probably where that threshold is, where we start to see a pretty rapid decline in probability of, of use just based off the height of shrubs. So, any other questions? Nope. Thank you. <laughs>